brothers and sisters, we now come to what we consider to be one of the high points of this convention. When a man is as well known as our next speaker, the best, the best course a chairman can take is to consider any introduction unnecessary and get him to the microphone as fast as possible. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present the senator, senior senator from the great state of Massachusetts, Ted Kennedy. Senator Kennedy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Red Smith. And in, I want to say right at the outset, it's a pleasure to be with a president that I can agree with as much as I do with Red Smith in this election year. <laughs> to Gene Glover and Al Hayes, who's served this great union for so many years, was a dear friend of President Kennedy, to Gordon Cole, our distinguished delegation from Massachusetts who uh, we met with just a little while ago, and friends all. Let me say what a pleasure it is for me to be here today and to address this convention of so many good friends in the Machinist Union. This is a special thrill for me, you know, for the last uh, few months I've just been uh, one young senator out of a hundred, minding my business and trying to do his job quietly in Washington. And now here I am, uh, standing in this great hall, addressing over a thousand members of one of the strongest unions in this great country of ours. And it just goes to show what having a famous brother-in-law can do for a guy. <laughs> and I want to say and now, of course, that I'm very much uh, aware of the great achievements that uh, Red Smith and the union has provided for the machinists uh, of this country, but I want to say that I really belong to the greatest union of them all, and that's the United States Senate, because I challenge the machinists to see whether they uh, have the kind of uh, good deal that we have in the United States Senate. We've got a six-year contract, a, a guaranteed annual wage, a short work week, absolute seniority, and if a member has a grievance, all he has to do is to get up and talk about it. And if the members don't like the pay, all they have to do is go out and vote themselves an increase. Now, can the machinists do that? <laughs> Whenever I'm uh, with uh, friends from labor, I can remember very well uh, what happened to me when I first ran for the United States Senate back in 1962. And I had a debate with my opponent, and we were in the final few minutes of that uh, debate, and uh, my opponent had the last words, and he got up and he said to that television audience all over Massachusetts, and furthermore, this man never worked a day in his life. Then I was about to spring out of my seat and speak to the uh, television uh, audience, and the moderator said, that's all, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the program. Then the uh, next uh, morning, I was up with Bill Walsh or Frank Avery outside of Boston, Massachusetts, about 5.30 in the morning, and one of the big machinists came up to me and he said, I watched that debate last night, Kennedy, and I heard what your opponent said about you, that you never worked a day in your life. Let me tell you something, you haven't missed a thing. <laughs> I'm honored to be with you in Los Angeles today and have the opportunity to address this important convention of the IAM. I'm especially pleased to come before you to plead the cause of Senator McGovern and Sergeant Shriver and urge the machinists and aerospace workers to give their strong endorsement to the national ticket of the Democratic Party. It is entirely fitting for the machinists to be in the forefront of our fight for a better America in the 1970s. When this union was organized 84 years ago, the nation was in the process of a vast industrial expansion led by the march of the railroads across the continent. The machinists led the American labor movement then, and you led the nation again in the 1960s when our target was the moon. And you can lead the nation again today when the challenge is of a different sort, 
to end this present era of special privilege and giant wealth and restore government in America for the benefit of the ordinary working man and women and all the other citizens of our nation. I'm proud to stand here with your president, Floyd Smith, one of the outstanding leaders of the American labor movement. He has fought to protect the hard-won rights of all of you under your collective bargaining contract. And thanks to the vigorous pressure he has brought, you may well overturn the Nixon Pay Board's unjust decision and succeed in obtaining the full retroactive pay increase that you won at the bargaining table. Lloyd Smith has also worked at the national level for programs to provide jobs for your members and for all American workers. As chairman of George McGovern's task force on economic conversion, President Smith is helping to shape new programs to meet the needs of machinists, the aerospace workers, and all American labor. And under Floyd Smith's leadership a month ago, together with the strong support of your local leaders throughout the nation, the IAM played a crucial role in gaining approval of a major bill I sponsored in the Senate to provide a new billion dollar program for the development of civilian technology to meet our urgent domestic problems. And under that bill, we will have vital new funds in fields like transportation and communications and energy supply and many other areas. Funds that mean new job opportunities for hundreds of thousands of members of this union. As President Kennedy said when he addressed your convention in 1963, on the occasion of your 75th anniversary, one of the great things about this country has been that our most extraordinary accomplishments have not come from the government down, but from the bottom up. It is the American working man who has made these accomplishments possible in the past. And it is the Nixon administration which has made them impossible over the last four years by denying you your jobs, by freezing your wages, and by stalling the magnificent engine of the American economy. That's what this election year is all about. And the morning after November 7th, we want a president who is working for us, not against us. We want a president who represents all the people, not just the chairman of the board. We want a president who represents all the machinists and aerospace workers, not just the big conglomerates and the international corporations. We need a president whose slogan isn't just business as usual, because when it's business as usual for this administration, it's the working man who gets left out. The ITT affair is the case that says it all. The doors of the White House are open to every chairman of the board, but they're bolted tight against the American working man. And you know how the payoff comes. It comes in opposition to tax reform. It comes in the $10 million secret slush fund the administration has collected for this campaign in flagrant violation of the spirit of our election laws. If one thing is clear in this election year, it's that a candidate for national office can't hide his contributions from the people. If Richard Nixon doesn't learn that lesson now, he's going to learn it on election day. And that's the way it is on every other issue. Wherever we look, we see the problem. The administration has failed the people on the war. It's failed the people on the economy. It's failed the people on the working man, and it's failed the people on health care. Let me take them one by one. The first and greatest failure, the one that leads all the rest, is the failure on the war. Since this administration took office, 20,000 more Americans have died in Indochina. Since they took office, Sixty billion more dollars have been spent on bombs and bullets in Vietnam. Since they took office, three million more civilians have joined the march of refugees fleeing the battlefields of Indochina. President Nixon knew how to stop a war. People want peace so much, he said, that governments had better get out of their way and let them have it. 
There was a president who practiced what he preached. President Eisenhower came to office in 1952 on a pledge to end the Korean War. And two years later, by 1954, the Korean War was over. Why doesn't President Nixon follow the example of President Eisenhower? Why doesn't he carry out the promise he made in 1968 to end the war? If President Nixon can claim credit for a ceasefire in the Middle East, why can't he obtain a ceasefire in Indochina? Of course, the President recently made another troop withdrawal announcement, pledging to bring our forces down to 29,000 men by the beginning of December. But you and I know that there is only one announcement the American people want to hear, and that is the announcement that the war is over. We want to bring our men home from Vietnam. We want our prisoners back. We want to stop spending our billions of dollars on Saigon and Indochina and start spending on the places that need it here at home. The second great failure of the administration is the failure on the economy. You don't have to tell the machinists about inflation or unemployment. You don't have to tell your wives about prices at the supermarkets. You don't have to tell anyone that this is an administration who put the economy through the ringer. The plight of the aerospace industry demonstrates the bankruptcy of the administration's economic policy. The president took office, defense and aerospace employment was at an all-time peak. And four years later, 500,000 aerospace workers have lost their jobs. Yet the administration did nothing to create the programs to put them back to work. Instead, they opposed every decent program Congress tried to pass. That's why phase two is in such trouble now, because the administration is far more serious about controlling wages than it is about controlling prices and unemployment. Why should the profits of the nation's largest corporations be going through the roof when the wages of the American working man are locked in the payboard cellar? It's all because we have a president who's more at home in Moscow and Peking than he is with Floyd Smith and the leaders of the American labor movement. It's all because we have a president who's trying to use the same old formula that has failed so often in the past. That formula never worked before. It didn't work for William McKinley. It didn't work for Warren Harding. It didn't work for Herbert Hoover, and it hasn't worked for Richard Nixon. The third great failure is the failure on the working man. I've seen the conditions people work in. And I've walked through the plants in California and Massachusetts and many other states, and I know the problems. Every year, over 15,000 American workers are killed outright on their jobs. The annual toll is higher even than the toll of the Vietnam War. Every year, 9 million more Americans, working men, are injured. And the additional toll from cancer or heart or lung conditions is even larger. I say we ought to oppose the killing inside American factories, as strenuously as we oppose the killing in Vietnam. <laughs> Congress has tried to do the job. We passed a law in 1970 to protect the health and safety of the workers, but we have a president who refuses to enforce it. In the past two years, the Department of Labor has hired only 400 inspectors to carry out the safety law that we passed in Congress. We need 4,000 inspectors, yet the administration fails to act. But we have an administration that cares more about the welfare of ITT and Penn Central than it does about the welfare of the working men and women. I say if we can keep 29,000 men in Indochina to protect the people of South Vietnam, we can put 4,000 men in plants and factories across the nation to protect the American worker. The fourth great failure is on health. In no other country in the world do so many workers pay so much for health and receive so little benefit. Why should the United States be the only country in the world 
without a program of comprehensive national health insurance. Thanks to the Machinious Union, you have health insurance to pay your bills. But look at what it costs you in your paycheck every week. The deductions you pay for health costs, you several cents an hour and many dollars a month and hundreds of dollars a year. Think of the extra take-home pay you'd keep if you didn't have to set aside a pile of extra dollars at the bargaining table to pay the bail for health. Think of the extra money you could spend for things like homes and schools if only you had a health care system that really did the job. Why should North American Rockwell care? Why should Boeing care? Why should McDonnell Douglas or any other employer care if thousands of machinists across this country want to spend their hard-earned money on health that's their affair. It's a free country. Business is free to make their profits out of health, and the workers are free to pay the bill. I've seen firsthand the health care crisis in this country. Again and again, I've seen it in the harsh hardships and ruined lives of working people and their families across the nation. We've allowed a situation to develop in which health care is the fastest growing, failing business in the nation. You and millions of other American workers around the country are playing Russian roulette with your health. You're paying twice as much as you ought to pay for health care, and the system simply isn't giving you the protection that you ought to have. Now we in Congress are trying to change all that. That's why I support the Health Security Act. It's the most important step America can take if we are serious about bringing decent health care to the people. We need a health care system where you can call a doctor and not just get an answering service because the doctor's out on the golf course. And when they rush you, and when they rush you to the hospital in an emergency, we want them to meet you at the door and ask you how sick you are, not how much health insurance you have. And when you get the bill, we want it to be sure it's stamped, paid in full by your health insurance without any loopholes or deductions so it won't be turned over to a collection agency to harass you when you're sick and you can't afford it. And that's why the Health Security Act is so important. I want health to be a basic right for all not just an expensive privilege for the few. I want every man, woman, and child in America to be covered for any illness by health insurance at a price he can afford to pay. No American should be given second-class health care because he's old or poor or black. I want a system that pays doctors and hospitals to keep people healthy instead of a system whose profits depend on illness. I want a health care system that has enough doctors and facilities to meet the need. I want a system that encourages doctors to practice their profession in every community in America, not just in the high-rise office buildings in Beverly Hills. <laughs> Those are the principles of the Health Security Act. Not everyone agrees with them today. The AMA does not agree. The health insurance industry does not agree. And Mr. Nixon does not agree. But I know that I agree, and I know George McGovern agrees, and I know that Floyd Smith agrees, and that hundreds and thousands and million machinists across America agree. We know who protects the insurance industry, but who protects the machinists? Who protects the working man? And who protects the people? It's all very well for the president to visit the Russians, the Chinese, but what about the problems of the people he leaves behind here at home? Where is the leadership we used to have? Where is the vision and the commitment that made America great? Where is the inspiration we need to meet the challenge? I'll tell you where they are. They're right where they have always been, in the leadership and vision of the Democratic Party. We are the real heirs. We are the real heirs of the American Revolution. We are the party of hope, not despair. We are the party of progress, not reaction. We're the party of reconciliation, not division. 
We have the leaders who can kindle once more our spirit of hope and confidence, a spirit that trumpets to the world that America is still the last best hope for peace and liberty of all mankind. We can build the kind of society we want, the kind President Kennedy worked for, and the kind Robert Kennedy dreamed of when he asked us to seek a newer world. We can end the war. We can bring the economy back to health. We can rebuild our cities. We can educate our children and bring decent health care to our people. We can do all the other things that we have to do. But the only way we can do these things is to work together with a president who cares about the rights of every citizen and who stands for all the people. You know where President Nixon stands. He's running for re-election against the American labor movement and against the American working man. You know where Floyd Smith stands. You know where the IAM stands. And you know where I stand. I stand with George McGovern for the rights of all the people, and we want all of you beside us. Thank you.